Jujutsu Kaisen Season 2 finally comes to a close this week, and what a journey it has been. From a surprising start with Meimei and Utahime dominating the first episode, to the evisceration of Gojo at the hands of Toji, his revival, ascension, and Geto's downfall. The start of Shibuya spearheaded by the death of Mekamaru, Gojo's ceiling, the deaths of both heroes and villains alike, and finally, the crescendo with Yuki Tsukomo making the save and confronting Pseudo Geto. Beyond just the anime, it's been a wild four months to go from a zero viewer Andy to just hundreds of thousands of people watching these videos, so I wanted to take a moment to just thank you guys, and I look forward to 2024, tons of content planned out. Anyway, we'll move on with the episode. Having first shown up in the tail end of Hidden Inventory, Yuki's philosophy of evolving humanity through the extermination of cursed energy remains strong even today, much to the displeasement of Pseudo Geto, his ideology being that of optimizing cursed energy. The two are at a narrative and literal standstill. Yuki, not wanting to make a move before her allies have had ample time to get Toto and others to safety, continues her back and forth with Pseudo Geto. This episode is incredibly dense on information and very light on action, so I'll do my best to break down this yap session. Where Yuki envisions a world in which everyone is effectively a Jujutsu Sorcerer, a world where the natural leakage of cursed energy is removed, and by proxy curses as well, Pseudo Geto, well, he isn't so kind. To him, the optimization of cursed energy is the next step in human evolution, a step that can only be taken through a motherfucking tournament arc, baby! Let's fucking go! Okay, I got a little carried away. When Pseudo Geto talks about optimizing cursed energy, he doesn't mean making sorcerers, non-sorcerers, cursed spirits train and hone their bodies to absolute perfection. Pseudo Geto is hundreds of years old. He's tried many different methods, but as he puts it, nothing he creates can exceed the bounds of his potential. What an incredibly hard line, and what a harder diss to his own son right in front of him. At death's door, Gojo unlocked his ability to use reverse curse technique. Just as Megami was about to summon Maharaga one last time against the second finger bear, effectively ending his life, he achieved his domain expansion. If cursed energy is a byproduct of negative emotion, then those negative emotions must be at their highest at the point of death. Pseudo Geto's plan involves creating chaos that he cannot control, and the way to achieve this is by having sorcerers past and present fight each other to the death to release that cursed energy and what he plans to do with it remains to be said in the anime proper. Just like how Sukuna has traversed the ages as a cursed object only to reincarnate within Yuji, hundreds of others have done the same through pacts with Pseudo Geto. The seals on the cursed objects have been removed by him and now hundreds of humans will have had their bodies taken over by sorcerers of the past and to just add even more fuel to the fire, using Mahito's now extracted technique which has been evolved because of his fight with Yuji, Pseudo Geto remotely casts Idol Transfiguration on two types of marked humans. One, those that have ingested cursed objects already, their bodies have now been altered to be strong enough vessels to not immediately die and house these reincarnated sorcerers and to normal humans without the ability to use curse techniques, their brains have now been altered just like Junpei's was back in Season 1, which allows them to have access to their own curse techniques. Essentially, what might end up happening is a battle royale, if everything goes to plan. Guess I jumped the gun with the tournament arc. The chaos created by all the death and destruction is what Pseudo Geto wants. Chaos that even he cannot control, allowing him to, in effect, bypass that limitation of his own potential. Yuki chastises Pseudo Geto for not thinking through and underestimating human rationality. How many of these newly awakened sorcerers would actually attempt to kill each other right off the jump? But Pseudo Geto hits her with the your questions are lacking perspicapity, perspicacity, perspicacity. Where have I heard that word before? My unmatched perspicacity, coupled with sheer indefatigability, makes me a feared opponent in any realm of human endeavor. Oh fuck, he's a Tate fan. No wonder he loves talking about himself so much. But he's not technically wrong. This plan of his has been hundreds of years in the making, so for it to be foiled by something as fickle as human rationality would indeed be silly. Despite this, Pseudo Geto isn't strong enough to fight everyone alone with Uraomedan for the count due to Chosu's blood, so he unveils the final kicker in his plan. Outside of vows made with sorcerers of the past, he'd also made vows with cursed spirits. However, these vows have become null and void now that he's in possession of Geto's body. With cursed spirit manipulation, he unleashes hundreds, no, perhaps thousands of curses. And a surprisingly beautiful track so late into the series erupts, perfectly encapsulating the mood of the scene. He makes his escape with the prison realm, but not without flaunting it one last time before dipping into the darkness. Yuji's cries out for Gojo ring through our ears, and the power cuts out. Hopefully that gives you an idea as to what just happened, and maybe showed you why they call him the Yap Demon. This portion of the episode was incredibly limited in motion, obviously, but it still featured some very creative shots, nice lighting, and some really strong and energetic drawings. Pretty much anything with Yuki was handled with utmost care, 
and I'm not exactly complaining. I joke about Pseudo Ghetto's yapping, but the truth is, whenever he's on screen, the actual plot and lore of the series is moved forward much more than with other characters. This to me makes all of his appearances very enjoyable and incredibly important, and this one was not any different. What is very different, however, is the anime's take on the second half, aka the, you know, we're at the end of our budget and time act. Jokes aside, in the manga, we're greeted with this set of pages. Utter chaos, chaos by design. With the news of Shibuya making its way to the masses, total panic. The anime's approach is much more detailed and surprisingly calm. People are unsure with what's happening and they just continue about their daily lives, blissfully unaware. Some even call what's happening a hoax, or, well, they're probably just recording a movie. The only ones in true panic are what I assume government officials with knowledge of cursed spirits and cursed energy. Plans get thrown out one after the other, but with how Gege writes the story, this might not be that important to us as readers. The scene shifts and Jujutsu Kaisen once again taps into its horror-esque nature. This admittedly long scene of a lost child scrounging up food in an abandoned supermarket is properly unsettling. At first, this ethereal looking curse motions at the child to come closer, but as she makes her way towards the door, the curse's form becomes more and more apparent. And to be honest, Gege does a really good job at creating monsters, so much so that I'd love to see him attempt to create a horror manga just like Junji Ito. Ah, who am I kidding? He's making that idol manga, isn't he? The girl can see curses, but she doesn't know what they are. This is what fools her into putting blind trust into this thing that she can only barely make out. And as she makes it past the door, the jaws of the fish from Nemo that had me scared of the ocean as a kid open wide. But... Wait, Yuta makes a save, having been completely absent in the story since the events of Zero, he finally makes his return. I really, really like the slight redesign here for Yuta, he's a bit more built than he was in Zero, and the way he carries himself exudes the confidence that he had built up throughout the events of Jujutsu Kaisen Zero, and his eye bags have also been nerfed a little bit. Anyway, the original main character is back, and the good guys might finally have a fighting chance. Itadori Yuja, Oh well, shit. Initially, I had thought and secretly hoped that the season would end right here, but I actually do like what they ended up squeezing in. The higher-ups ruling that Gojo is to be exiled, Yuji's sentence to be resumed and then executed by Yuta, and then Yaga to also be executed for aiding Geto and Gojo. It is nice that they included this, and I think it gives a good little teaser for what's to come in the future. This episode did feature a lot of time-saving techniques like reusing shots or long panning ones, but I think this shot, but I think this shot of Yuji walking around just went on and on. But I get it. We'll never, you know, we're never gonna shit on the animators here because they are the victims. You get the idea. With the thousands of curses released, Yuji claps his hands, and two spring up at him, and Jujutsu Kaisen season two is over. Give these animators a break, they just finished the season!